Thank you so much for that nice introduction. <laughs> Very much appreciated. Yes, I am Jorgen Hesselberg. Uh, I am the co-founder of Comparative Agility. But more than anything else, I am an agile enthusiast and I guess you can call it an agile nerd. I truly believe in agility. I've seen the change that it makes in people's lives. And I know it makes such a big difference when you're able to embrace agility at all levels of the organization. The thing about agility, too, is that it becomes more and more important as the world is changing and as change in itself is accelerating. And of course, now with AI, you can see that data becomes more important as well. And I think that's sort of what we're seeing in general when it comes to agility. Our industry has changed from sort of being a, a really interesting technical type of exercise that ended up being a mindset to now becoming a company-wide, organizational-wide movement where people understand that the way we work has to change to adapt to the conditions that we're working in now. And data becomes part of that equation. I think we understand that without data, this becomes very difficult. So this is what this talk is all about. It's about how you can unlock agility at the enterprise level using data as part of a way to embrace culture, because that's part of what we're doing here. We're changing the culture, leveraging data to inform our decision making. Um, I did make uh, some, some progress as a change agent myself for well, must be around 15 years now since 2007 and up. And I did write a book about it as well. So you can find that and look at that if you like. It's called Unlocking Agility. And it's out there if you're interested in how to do these things from a, from a more sort of practical as well as with a theoretical background. But what we're going to do in this particular webinar is to really look at how you can use data as one of the ways to embrace this culture of data-driven continuous improvement. Because... Without that data to inform your decisions, it becomes very difficult. You can't just go with gut feel. So I want to try to show you how to do that in a very practical way. I'm going to use comparative agility to show you how to get this set up sort of step by step and very hands on. And then after that, I'll also give you a couple of things that might be useful as a backdrop. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll set up your organization. We'll show you how you can get going and, and, and send out surveys to get some really interesting information so that you can start to embrace this, this data-driven culture. And then we'll look at the analysis and the kind of results we get. We'll look at the reports and how we can make sense of those reports. And then ultimately, we need to take some action. And I'll show you how you can do that, what, what the process looks like when you take that action and how you get to it. And, and that's, of course, never a singular decision that's made by one person. You know, taking action and interpreting the data is always a group decision. It's something where you want to make sure that you involve individuals and in interactions over just the data in itself. And that's, of course, a very agile way of working at things. And there is one key success factor I want to mention as well. All of this is dependent on one key success factor, and I will tell you what that is later on in the webinar. And, of course, at the end, we will do some Q&A. So I'll be more than happy to do that with you and answer some questions if you have any. So I think this could be kind of fun. So let's get started right away. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to Comparative Agility. And what we're going to start doing is to look at the kind of things we can do in this platform. Very simply, what does it mean to get started embracing a culture of data-driven continuous improvement? What does it look like? So what we're going to do is first, we're going to set up a structure, which is a, a great way for us to organize our data. Then we'll set out some surveys, we'll get some data through those surveys. Then we'll start to look at the analysis. And then, of course, we'll look at the reports themselves and then start taking some action. So why don't we create a structure right away? What we do here is we go to the structure screen. What I'm going to do here is go to create folder and create a folder, which is going to sort of be the parent folder of all of this. And in this case, let me just call this uh, company. It's a nice uh, high level name for, for a parent. And then underneath that, why don't we create a structure that more or less mimics the organization itself. Now, it all depends on how you're set up. You can set this up in any way you want, but let's just set up in a very sort of basic setup. Let's, uh, let's say use something that's uh, fairly common. Maybe we will have a division underneath here. And underneath the division, we might uh, perhaps have a portfolio. And in that portfolio, we may have a number of different programs. You know, programs can take, uh, you know, some different names. Some people call them arts. 
uh, idle release trains. Uh, others just call them programs. So let me just call this a program uh, and just to show you how you can set this up. And then underneath the programs, that's where the teams come up. And here, of course, you can create teams and you can create as many as you want. And let me just call this uh, team one. Uh, actually, in fact, it's called team two there. Uh, and then we'll call this, uh, how about we call this squad one, just to make sure we can get that set up. And people use different names for, for teams as well. All good. No worries there. The important thing, of course, is that you set this up and you do it in a way that makes sense to you. So I'm just going to rename this also just to make sure you can see how quickly you can make this. If you make any changes, you can make that uh, change very quickly. You saw what we did here. Very quickly, we just set up a structure. That's all it takes to get started. Uh, there's no hocus pocus. You can also move these structures around if you make mistakes or if your organization change, that's fine. The important thing is you get the structure set up and at this point, you're ready to send out the survey after you add your team members. How do you add the team members? Pretty simple. You can just go to the team itself. You click on this little team members icon here. And you can just type in the emails of the people that's going to get the surveys. So I'm going to put in myself in this one. And again, you can add as many team members as you like. We don't do any, any types of limits to how many team members. So, you know, typically we have seven plus minus two. Uh, in terms of the number of team members per team, but there's no limit here. So you can set this up how you want. And here we go. You can see that that team member now is recorded. At this point, what you can do is you can send out the capability and you can decide what type of survey you want to send out. Now, you know what comparative agility is famous for. Well, other than the comparative part, we do compare data to all sorts of interesting data sets. The other part of it is, of course, that we are a platform. We are the Spotify of continuous improvement. And what we mean by that is that we have lots of really, really great surveys. We don't have music like Spotify does, but we have surveys. And those surveys have two things in common. Number one, they are created by domain experts. And number two, they are validated by data scientists. And you can see that if you look at all the different capabilities that we have, if you look at our portfolio of capabilities, you see people here that you probably have heard of before. If I say Mike Cohn and Kenny Rubin, you probably heard that name before. If I say Bjarte Boxnes, that's probably a name you've heard. If I mention Rob Myers or Dr. Amy Edmondson or maybe even people like uh, Esther Derby, these are probably people you've heard of. They are luminaries in the agile industry. They are what we consider the best of the best in terms of the thought leaders. Those are the people who create the survey. And then we have our data scientists make sure to validate the surveys so you can trust them, that they are valid and reliable. So that's good. When you send out the survey, you go in here and you add your capability and you know you can trust those particular surveys. You can then choose whichever survey you want. You add the capability. And once you've done that, you're ready to go. You can then send out the survey by clicking share and invite your teammates. Easy as that. When you do that, you can see that I'm already added because I was part of the team. You can then add another team member if you want. And there's a default here that kind of shows you what that particular message looks like. You can change it if you like, and then you can send it out. And there you go. Once you do that, the person who is the recipient, the person who is part of the team will then get a link in an email and click that link and then answer the survey. And then you will see that these responses will increment by one per person. So that's quite useful. What's really nice about this is that we make sure that you can answer a survey twice. So that's one thing that's nice. The other part is we also make sure that you can send reminders only to those people who haven't responded. So that means you won't spam people, which is always nice. So that's how that part works. Once you've done that, there's a couple of other things I could mention here, but I really want to focus on just getting the survey out and get started. And really what the value is here, of course, is the data that we get later on. So that's what we're going to spend the bulk of this webinar on. But I wanted to show you how quickly you can set up that particular structure, because that's one of those things, especially if you're a large enterprise with all sorts of different teams and complex structures, it's nice for you to know that you can set this up pretty quickly. We can even support you if you have value streams that go across different programs. That does happen sometimes. If that's the case, what you can do is you can add tags. By adding a tag, let's say here, for instance, I'm going to add a tag. Yeah, let me call this uh, retail. If I do that, that means that I can send out 
all sorts of different types of surveys for this particular team, knowing that it's going to be tagged as retail. So if I have another team in a different program and I also tag that retail because it may belong to the same value stream, that's a quick way for me to make sure that these things are actually captured. Now, how can I take advantage of that? Well, you create your filters. So if I go in here and I say, okay, I'm going to create a filter and I'm going to make sure that I do this for the company, which is my data structure, and I'm going to include retail. So if I apply, see, is exactly that retail data. That's the tag that we just created. That's a really nice way for you to make sure you can get exactly the data you want. You can see it's in draft mode right now. So if I go in here and I save it, you just call this a retail filter, just to kind of make sure I can make that very simple. And I save that. Now, this is a filter that I can use. So this is nice. If I clear this now, and you can see here, in this case, I have all of this information. If I just click on the retail filter, there you go. I only get to see the data I care about. So if you can imagine, if you had several teams across multiple programs with the retail tag, that would be a great way for you to make sure that just those particular teams in that value streams are the ones that you care about. So just a quick filter that you can use. And I think that'll really save you a lot of time, especially for those of you who are larger enterprises. All right, good stuff. So, so far, what we've done is we created a structure. We're now ready to get to the point where we can start to do some analysis. And this, of course, is where the fun begins. So what do we do? Well, let's go to analysis. And in this case, you know, I'm going to do this using some test data to kind of show you how this works. But what you would do is you would look at your analysis and what you would do is you will say, okay, what kind of data am I looking to compare? What kind of information am I looking for here? Now, the good news is the more data you collect, the more teams you involve, the more interesting information you can get, the more richness is what you can look for. So in this case, we're looking at comparative agility as our capability. And you can see that the screen here is sort of split in two. On one hand, you have what we call well, the target data set, which is the data that you want to compare. So the data you're looking to compare is on the left-hand side. Now, in this case, you can see it here. That's all the data that we have co collected. This is data that we can start to look for when we're trying to see where we're going to go next. So what kind of information are we looking for? Now, on the right-hand side, you have the data you can compare it to. So here on the left-hand side, the data set we want to compare. On the right-hand side, what do you want to compare it to? So as you can tell, this is quite interesting. Now you know the data you have on the left-hand side is the data you want to compare. And then on the right-hand side, you have the data that you want to compare it to. Now you can do all sorts of interesting permutations here. If you look at the data on the left-hand side, you have the portfolio, a product line, a division. Underneath there, you have a location, and then you have multiple teams. Here's Team AHA, Duran Duran, Erasure, and then you have a number of other teams here on the Chicago. So you can take any of these data sets or any aggregation of these data sets and then compare that to anything you want on the right-hand side. Now, on the right-hand side, you have the World Index, which is the world's largest agility index. We have more than 4 million data points at this point. So this is one of those things that keeps growing. And, and it's uh, really the, the good, bad, and ugly of Agile wouldn't say it's necessarily something you should strive for, but I do think it's a really accurate approximation of what's happening in Agile today. Now, we also have an industry-specific benchmark, so it, of course, is a specific benchmark to a certain industry. So if you want to compare yourself to a given industry, that would be a great index to use. You can also do no benchmark if you just want to just purely see how you're doing and not compare yourself to anything. And then you have trends if you want to see how you're doing over time. That can be quite useful as well. Here is a chance to compare yourself to the last period. If you just want to compare yourself to how you did last time you did a survey, for instance, this could be very useful. Let's say you do SAFE and, and maybe you do PI planning every three months. This would be a great way, a great little shortcut to see how you're doing compared to last time. And then, of course, here are other parts of your organization. So you can compare yourself to other parts of your organization or to yourself at a different point in time. What I can do, for instance, I can look at Team AHA and just take this one team and compare that to the World Index if I want to. Like, how is that one team doing compared to the rest of the world? I can definitely do that. I can also compare that team to an industry-specific benchmark if I want to. 
telecommunications, no problem. Now, I can also do the entire location of Berlin, the aggregate of Berlin. I can do that compared to the World Index, of course, but also to, for instance, other parts of my organization. Maybe I want to see how Berlin is doing as a whole compared to Chicago as a whole. That is possible to do. That is a legitimate comparison. Now, I want to say one word about comparing yourself to other entities. I never think it's a good idea to compare one team to another team. Definitely not a good idea. I think that's kind of the same as trying to compare velocity between teams. It's not something we do, not very useful. What I think can be useful, though, is to look at one team compared to other aggregations inside your organization. So for instance, if I wanted to look at Team AHA, which is just one team inside of the Berlin program, so to speak, I think it's fair to do that comparison where I can say, well, I'm just going to look at that one team, Team AHA, to all the other teams in Berlin. I think that's fair because that's sort of a I guess you can say a brotherly comparison. You can see how are my peers doing? How am I doing compared to all the other teams in that particular program? I think that's a fair comparison. I think the best comparison, though, is to compare yourself to yourself at different points in time. How is Team AHA doing now compared to what it did three months ago, for instance? That's an excellent comparison. So the point being, there's all sorts of different permutations you can do here. That is part of the strength of the platform. It's also part of what's going to give you a lot of richness as to why things are happening right now in your organization. What's the data telling you? All of these things are going to help you because you can slice and dice the data in ways that make sense to you. Now, what we're going to do for this webinar is do a relatively simple report that involves a lot of data so that you can kind of get an idea of the power of the platform, but also what kind of insights we get out of it. So in this case, why don't we go in here and say, let's do the entire Division A. So what we're looking at now is Division A, and we're including all the teams in Berlin and all the teams in Chicago. That is a pretty, pretty big data set. And then let's look at comparing it against the World Index. So in this case, we're looking at Division A, versus the world, the CA World Index. This is a pretty big report, but it's going to be quite useful for us because now we'll have a chance to see how that entire division is doing compared to the rest of the world. Now, let's look at the results. And now we're at the point where we're looking at the reports themselves and what kind of insights they give us. So let's look at this from a few angles and see some of the things that we can do with this particular data. First of all, we're looking at division A, which is what we chose on the left-hand side of that previous screen. And then on the right-hand side, we have the CA World Index. That was that comparison data set, if you remember. Now, this is good. Now, what does it mean? Well, what's happening is that the CA World Index, in this case, is normalized to zero. So this, this horizontal line here is the CA World Index. This means that every time Division A is indicating they're doing better than the world, it's going to be above the line, positive or blue. And every time Division A is saying they're doing worse than the world, it's going to be below the line, negative or orange. So right off the bat, we can see that in the major divisions, the main, we call them categories or dimensions, we're doing better than the world, which is nice. That's, that's, a, that's a good step. You can see here that in teamwork, there's a couple of things that stand out, and we'll go into more detail later. Same thing with requirements. But in planning, we seem to be doing fairly well. Knowledge creating outcomes looking pretty good. We can also look at our radar view. We can see the same thing here. Here are the average scores, and you can see us here in red. And we are outperforming the world index here in most of these categories. Now, if you go to technical practices, you see that the picture becomes a little bit more muddy because you can see that we're not quite being quite as dominant there. And you can see that there might be some challenges and we'll look into that more afterwards. But it's a quick way for you to get us a little view of how things are looking. You can also look at your average scores. Average scores is literally what it says. It just gives you an idea what the average score of all those people who took the survey is. And it also gives you a very quick view of which of the particular dimensions might need more attention than others. And you see a couple here, like technical practices seems to be a challenge. You see there's some issues in quality and, of course, a requirement as well. But outcome seems pretty good. All good stuff as we go down to our analysis. Now, here's another thing that I think we want to include when, as we look at this data. 
distributional characteristics. What that is doing is giving us what we call a box plot. That is essentially a way to visually illustrate the level of cohesion or agreement inside the data set. So when you see a very large vertical bar, in this case, a large vertical box plot, that tells you that there's a lot of dispersion of the data, that people are not agreeing with each other. This is quite interesting because when we start to click on any of these categories and go a little bit deeper, we can start to tell a story about what's going on. Look at test-driven development, for instance. In this case, we see a question here, and it says, most code is written using test-driven development. Okay, fair. That's a, a question that's relatively benign. It's just saying that more often than not, most code that we write we're using TDD. Well, in this case, you can see that it's a relatively large bar here. So that's telling you that in that data set that we just ran, that is not really quite common. And there is quite a bit of disagreement around how we answer that question. What you can also see is if you look at the averages for that particular question, that's also a pretty low average. 2.41 out of 5 is quite low. So we're not doing so well from an average perspective. We're also not doing so well if we look at the differences from the benchmark. Compared to the rest of the world, we tend to not do so much TDD. And then, of course, here we can also see that you know people are not really agreeing with each other. So some teams are doing it and some are not. Now, the tool here is not telling us that we should be doing TDD. It just says that given best practices or given our experience around patterns and norms and behaviors of successful Agile teams, TDD tends to be one of those things that people think about if they care about quality. Now, there might be good reasons not to do it. So that's something we need to talk to our teams about. But I do think what this does is show us from a data perspective that this might be something we want to have a conversation with the team about. So I'll get back to you on that and we'll talk more about that later. Now, what else can we do? Well, some interesting things. We have an insights tab here, which is really great. That insights tab give us a very good view of the key strengths and the key opportunities inside of the data set that we just ran. We can see right away where we're doing fairly high, so in, well, fairly well in terms of the scores, like high scores. Where are we doing great? Well, when it comes to estimates, for instance, you know, everyone seems to be involved in doing the estimation. Great, good stuff. When we look at the statements with the largest positive difference, where we're doing fairly well compared to the world index, these are things we can also look at very quickly. And the same thing for where we're doing fairly well in terms of agreement, where we tend to be on the same page. Those are great things. If you want to look at some of the opportunities, though, we can see those very quickly here also. For here, instance, is a question around testing. At the end of each iteration, there's little or no manual testing required. Well, that's a question around automation, essentially, is what it's saying. And it's saying here that that question here has a 2.27 average. That's not very high. These are the questions with the lowest scores. Now, as we look through this, we can see that there's other questions also around technical practices like, like TDD that we looked upon earlier. This has uh, quite a, a negative score in terms of the difference uh, from the benchmark. And also here is another question here that has uh, not so much agreement in themselves. So you can see there's some questions that aren't scoring so well, but at the same time, they're also not on the same page. Things are starting to emerge. This is good as we look at these requirements, as we look at the challenges, and you can see that, okay, it looks to be the case here that we're doing some questions and not all of them are performing so well as we like. You know, we, we looked at that question here. This is typical at the end of each iteration, there's little or no manual testing. I mean, it really does say that there's quite a bit of manual testing required here. I mean, know what that does. It slows things down. So we will get to that a little bit later and, and look at that in more detail. Now, this is all good. At this point, we're starting to get an idea of what the story is. We're starting to get a pretty good idea of where we need to focus next. But what we don't know at this point is really how all of these teams contribute to that score. You know, remember, we ran that for Division A. That was an entire Division A. But we didn't really, we don't really know at this point how each team is contributing to this particular score. We have a big picture view for sure, but we don't know how each of the teams contribute to that big picture. So how do we do that? Well, one way we can do that is to run the impact matrix. The impact matrix is a proprietary matrix that we created. And the point of that matrix is sort of twofold. One, 
to understand how each of the teams contribute to the overall score, and the second, to understand how you should approach the team and also how you should prioritize it in your improvement efforts. So let's look at this matrix. On the x-axis, we have performance, which essentially is the degree to which people are scoring high or low on these particular questions. On the y-axis, we have cohesion, which is a slightly more sophisticated way of measuring standard deviation, which is just a measure of the central tendency of the data. So this is a way for us to basically see where are teams scoring high and being on the same page, and where are they not? And what does that mean to how we are looking at their coaching? If we look at this green zone, for instance, we call that amplify, which just simply means let's do more of it. Here, we're talking about teams that are indicating they're having high performance, high cohesion. It means they're doing fairly well, and they tend to be on the same page. So these teams here, we probably want to do more of what they're doing. We probably want to observe them to, to validate that this is indeed what's happening. But then we probably want to make sure that we can spread this goodness across the organization. And we can do that in many ways. We could do brown bag lunches. We could do demonstrations. We could bring it up in town halls. Whatever it is, we want to amplify what's happening here. The teams here, uh, we see Team Wham is clearly in this particular category. And you see a couple of teams that are kind of on the on the cusp, like Team Dolphins. Now, if we look at this yellow zone here, this is called a line. So that means we need to kind of clarify some things, perhaps. High performance, low cohesion. This, this is teams that, that you can see in this particular category that exhibit high performance and low cohesion, which means they're doing fairly well, but they're not on the same page. They tend to disagree with each other. They might not be on the same page when it comes to definition of done. They might not agree with each other on what is CI, like continuous integration. There could be all sorts of areas here that they really aren't agreeing with each other. These are typically leading indicators. And you see there's quite a bit of teams here that are not doing so well. Leading indicators, which means these are teams you probably want to pay some attention to. What do you do with them? Well, you know, that will, of course, depend on what happens when you talk to them. But I would say, based on what the data is showing us, do you want to try to probably align the teams around some of these concepts? What does it mean when they say they're doing CI, for instance? Or what does it mean when they're trying to do pair programming? Is it something they do all the time? Or do they occasionally do it? Or what's the definition of done, period? I mean, there's all sorts of different things that can be manifesting itself in these teams. So my advice when you see teams that are in this category is to try to help them out and see what you can do to see to get on the same page because they clearly are having some challenges here. Now, sometimes you see teams in the mitigate column or category. Mitigate, well, it's as you can see, the red zone. This literally means low performance and low cohesion. These are teams that you really need to take some action on because they're indicating they're not doing well and they're not agreeing with each other. They're kind of screaming for help, to be honest with you. So these are teams I would check out right away. You can see a couple of them here. Uh, in this case, Duran Duran and Holy Rollers. Sometimes you will see teams in the improve category. This doesn't happen too often, but it does happen sometimes. In this case, low performance, high cohesion. That means that these teams are doing, well, they're doing fairly poorly, actually, but they know they're not doing so well. They have a high level of cohesion. So these are teams that kind of tend to be able to take care of their own business. What I typically recommend you do if you see teams in this category is to let them improve, let them do their work, observe them by all means, but don't interfere necessarily. Let them let them do their work because they kind of know that things are not working. So give them a chance to do that and help them if they need it. But, you know, and usually in this case, I would, I would kind of give them a chance to do, do their own work because they probably know they're having some problems. So this is where we are. We have a big picture view. We know where the challenges are. We also know how we're doing from a radar perspective. We can go down and look at the different categories and break it down from an average perspective. And then, of course, we also see overall how the entire map is looking and how each team is contributing to that score. We can actually, and which is kind of cool, double click on any of these teams and get a report that is specific for that team. We know how we're doing from a high perspective in terms of the whole division, but now we can also see how that particular team contributes to that score. And look at this. This is Team Duran Duran. Remember, that was in the, the, the category that we call the red zone. So this is mitigate. These teams are having challenges. And you can see it's a very different picture here 
for what's happening with Team Duran Duran. Uh, you know, a very different picture of what we saw earlier, and you can see that they need some help, and, and that's okay. That's our job to do that. Now we can start to see where that help is needed. So now we know how Team Duran Duran is doing. Now let's get back to where we were. Here we are back again to the bigger picture. And the question now is, what are we going to do? What kind of actions are we going to take as we go further? Well, one of the things we can do is look at the recommendations that are generated by the system. What recommendations does comparative agility recommend we take a look at? What we have here are AI-based recommendations that are curated by CA experts. So here, in this case, at the end of each iteration, there's little or no manual testing required. What you will see is a pretty decent overview of why this particular question is so important, what kind of topic it covers, and some activities you can take to try to be better at actually reducing manual testing and increasing automation. It also talks about some of the questions you can ask to try to get better at this particular question. And this is good for us because this is not so much about the answers. You know, the point here isn't just to get to the answer. The point here is to try to ask better questions. And this information here is going to help you do that. It's going to help you explain why automation is so important for your team, but then also some of the activities you can take with your team to help you with automation. And later on, some of the questions that you can ask to improve further. So those are things that's going to help you accelerate your work as a coach and as a change leader. It's not going to give you all the answers. It's not going to replace you as a coach. That's not the point here. It's going to help you do your job better and also save you some time. That, that's where data can be really useful. If we look at this also, here's another one around TDD. It talks about why TDD is important, some of the things you can do, and some of the activities that might help you get there, and some of the questions you can ask to go, go further. So these are all really useful things that you can do as you start to understand the narrative behind your data. You saw what we did. We went to the point where we can start to analyze data at the program level, go down to each team, see how they're doing, and also see how each contributes to our overall score to help us prioritize our efforts. Then go down to the recommendations to then look at those as a way to start to work with the team. So that's how that works. But let's take a closer look at this. What does this mean? If we look at this, this is all positive stuff. But what it doesn't do, and this is one of those things that's important when we are looking at doing this from an organizational perspective, is that it doesn't tell us why. The data really helps us separating the signal from the noise. You know, with all the teams that we're looking at, when we're looking at the organization overall, we need to understand what we need to focus on and what we can ignore because there's so much information. So that data helps us with this, but it doesn't tell us why. And that's our job as change leaders to then engage with our teams to understand how that happens. And I'm going to show you now the process that we typically see our clients use to try to get to a closer look at this. So let's just kind of go back again to what we just did. You know, we ran these reports and what we did is we tried to find a narrative in what's going on. What's the story that the teams are telling us? And in this case, we saw that there were some issues around testing. Remember this one. At the end of each iteration, there's little or no manual testing required. We saw that that was a real problem. Okay, this is good. We looked at the data. We looked at the recommendations. We know the things we can take. What's the next step? Well, what we always recommend you do is that you do some type of activity with your team. You need to understand the context and not just say that, okay, we ran the analysis. We have the answers. Try now to use that data as an invitation to a conversation. So what we always recommend you do is do something like a modified open space session. You can use liberating structures. You can do all sorts of coaching tool. And this is where really great experienced coaches can, can do a lot of good. The data in itself will help you focus your effort and know where the challenges are. But to understand the why and the next steps, I always recommend you do that as part of an exercise with your team. So here's an example of how you can do this. One thing, for instance, would be a modified open space session. And one of those things could be something where you start off with the what, like what impediments did we just observe? The what in this case, of course, is the data itself. And we saw, for instance, in the previous example, that we're not doing a lot of automation. You know, that's what the team was telling us here through the data. So then what we do next is we have a team exercise where we talk to the team and we say, well, so what? Given that we don't do a lot of automation and we have a lot of manual testing at the end of our iteration, 
What is the impact of that? What's the so what? And then when you have that conversation with the team, you will find that by not doing automation, you know, you will see that stories don't get done on time. You know, they have to maybe flow to the next sprint, which is clearly an anti-pattern. You may see that uh, defects in production go up over time. You might see uh, morale go down because people are not really proud of their work. I mean, there's all sorts of different impacts of doing that by not doing automation and not taking quality seriously. So what do we do with that information? Well, we bring that up to the team and the team itself helps contribute to making that story clear for us. The next step then is the now what? So now that we understand the problem, we understand what the impact is of that problem, what are we going to do next? What actions are we going to take to address the impediments? Well, this is really good because now we as a team can be part of the solution. And there's all sorts of solutions here, right? And again, no simple answers. But what can we do to increase automation? Well, maybe if we do TDD, for instance, we can have more of an emergent design. We can maybe implement a testing framework. Uh, I mean, there's uh, new automation tools we can implement. Uh, we can get a technical coach to help us. I mean, there's all sorts of different things we can do. The point being that you, together with your team, help decide those actions and, and do that based on the data that the team revealed through your analysis. So that's how you take that next step. That's one example. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but this is one way that you can definitely take that data and involve your team in an engaging conversation, a invitation to a conversation, if you will. Now, the next step after that is I typically recommend you do some interviews. And I don't mean to interview every single person one-on-one. -on -one. I think that will take way too much time. And there's some value in that, but I think it's way too much time for not that much value. I think the best way to go here is to maybe choose 20% or so of the data set. So maybe in a in a team of, of eight people, take, take a person or two, you know, something like that. And then talk to them one-on-one -on -one and try to gain some insight in a safe and confidential environment and then ask them a couple of questions, a couple of open-ended questions. You can ask them whatever you think is useful, but there's really two questions in particular that I think are really useful. The first one is, what surprised you about the results? What surprised you about the data? That, I think, can be really useful. You'll get some really interesting insights if you ask that question. And the second thing, what is the data not telling us? What are some of the things that these results are not telling us that are really happening? That's another question I think is really useful. And you'll get some really interesting information if you ask those questions in the interview. There's, of course, many other questions you can ask, and you can see some of those on the screen. Like, for instance, if you could make one change, you know, what would that be? I mean, that could be a really nice, concrete thing. Or what's the greatest challenge we're facing right now? Those are also very good, concrete things. But I think asking very open-ended questions here could be quite useful. So that's another step you can take. It's part of forming your narrative of what to do next. Now, here's another step that I think is extremely important. If you don't want to forget this, we just used comparative agility as part of a way to identify where the challenges were. And that is awesome. But remember, this is subjective information. This is data that's based on the team's perception. And that is, of course, their reality. So it is very important. But it isn't objective data. And we need to have some objective metrics also. Now, which objective metrics you should select here? really depends on your organization. It depends on your context. Uh, it really, really belongs to a business decision, really. What is important for your organization? What are you trying to accomplish? And what metrics do you choose that help you approximate how you're doing towards that goal? That's the important metric you should choose. There are a couple I always recommend. Lead time is a nice metric. That's very hard to game. And I think most organizations, regardless of context, want to work a little faster. So I think that's a good one. Flow efficiency percentage, really great metric. Great way for you to see whether or not you're wasting a lot of time on handoffs. So I think that's a wonderful metric. MTTR is great. Mean time to build recovery. Defects in production is good. NPS, net promoter score, you've seen those. The point I'm trying to make with this it isn't so important that you do all of these metrics. I think it's important that you do a balancing set of metrics. So for instance, if you're looking at quality and speed, those are nice metrics. Do lead time 
and things like uh, defects in production over time, for instance, because they balance each other out. They're both objective and they balance each other out. If you really focus on speed, you could suffer with quality, right? Or if you just focus on quality, you could actually suffer in speed. So having both of those metrics at the same time help balance each other out. And I think that could be useful. So as you're doing comparative agility and getting that story, make sure you also gather objective metrics and try to tie it back to corporate objectives. Because if you can show corporate that, hey, you know, all the things that we think is important, we are actually making progress on in those areas. So I think that's important to try to find metrics here that very much go back to the corporate objectives. But the things I mentioned here are, are kind of evergreen. I think there's very rarely will you see anyone saying that, oh, we don't want to work faster or we don't want more quality. I think that's very rare. So I think it's fair to, to always focus on these kind of things. Now, last step. And this is, of course, the most important step of all. It really doesn't matter what you do if you don't do this, because at the end of the day, you need to take action. You need to be able to get this data, have the conversation with the team, interview people to understand the context together with them, and then have some objective metrics to ultimately decide on what to do next. That is all very important, but the reason we do this is because we want to take action. And to do that, you ultimately may need to go up a step or two. Usually the kind of things you will find here are things that will require some leadership access. It will require some approval, perhaps for additional resources or for additional people. It might also require some political support, you know, especially if you're working in a large organization. And that means you need some leadership cover and some leadership support. This is true, of course, with agility in general. I have never seen a single organizational agility effort or any type of enterprise transformation work without leadership support. So let me just say that you need that. Now, how do you get that support and what kind of actions do you take? Well, you go to your leader, the sponsor or whoever is is, is the person who can make some, some efforts here and who actually has some authority to, to issue some funds. You go to that person and you present the results. You tell them that I just use the world's largest agility assessment platform. I took that survey tool and I got some data from my teams. They identified where the problems were. I then did workshops to understand exactly what we can do to try to fix it. I interviewed people to get additional context. I combined this with objective data. And here's the one or two things I'd like to do next. Now, maybe four things at the most, but I would recommend you keep it to one or two things because we want to limit WIP. We don't want to do too many things at once and you want to do things that actually matter. So try to do one or two things and just focus on those things first. Then tell the leader, I have just now identified the things I'd like to do next. I'm now asking for two things from you. Number one, I'm asking for executive support. And with that, I mean political support. I need you to support me politically so that when I make these changes together with my team, we're going to have support from everyone. We're not going to have people work against this or sabotage it or do whatever to make this less successful. You need that political support, especially if you're doing things that are really meaningful. People, as you know, are a little bit afraid of change sometimes. And the second thing, I need some financial support. More often than not, if you're doing things that are meaningful and definitely if they're changing the existing processes, you might need some additional funding. It might mean that you need some infrastructure improvements. It might need uh, some additional tooling. It might need some additional people coming in or maybe a technical coach or someone else with expertise you don't have. Regardless, it might need some additional financial support. So those are the two things you need from that leader. You need to have them understand the kind of changes you're making, but then you need political support and financial support. But I will say this, if you present this data, if you present these results and these recommendations as a data-driven process like we just did now, I do not think you're going to get a no. Honestly, leaders of any organizations that are successful and want to get better, they understand the need to invest in this. And as long as they understand that you've done your homework, as long as they understand that you've done the work necessary to come up with these particular actions, and they're based on solid, rational discussion, you will get some support for this. And I don't think that's going to be a problem. Now, when you get that support, what you're going to do next is to communicate that broadly to the organization. Tell them that 
you were able to take the data based on their feedback, thank them for taking the survey, and then based on those insights that you got from that feedback, you're now going to make some changes and you have the executive support to do so. And then make those changes, be very vocal about it, and be very visible about it. Also, if you make some mistakes, because that's very common. But then do this very clearly and visibly, and then come back every, I want to say, two to three months. You know, It depends on what kind of changes you're making. But I want to say at least every three months or so, make sure you get back to the organization, especially the people who took the survey, and say, hey, here's where we were. These are the things you said were problematic. These are the changes we made. And this is where we are now. And oh, by the way, here's where we're going to go next. Keep doing that, keeping visible, keeping very transparent about what you're doing, also the challenges, so that they can understand that their input mattered. People can see that taking the survey actually made a difference. You took that data, those insights, and you made a difference. And it's actually going to address the challenges that they saw were the real problems. Because at the end of the day, the teams were the ones who identified this. So that's the key and the secret to all of this. This is how you create that culture of data-driven continuous improvement. Because when people can see that you're making these changes and they can see that the changes are based on their feedback and their input and that their voice matters, that's when you can start to create this culture of data-driven continuous improvement. So that is how this works. Now, in a nutshell, just summarize the things we did. It isn't that complicated, but it is some work involved. We started off collecting the data, and you saw this. We, we set up comparative agility, created the structures, we set out the surveys. Didn't take that much time, but we, we had to do the work. After that, we find the narrative. When we have the data, we start to find the story behind the data. We compare ourselves to ourselves over time. We can compare ourselves to an industry index. We can compare ourselves to other parts of the organization. The point being, we're trying to find out what is happening? What's the what's the voice of the teams telling us? Then we have to understand the context. We know that the data itself is not enough. It, it tells us where we need to focus, but to find the context and to get sort of the, the truth of the matter, the why, as we call it, we need to talk to the teams. And then go one-on-one. -on -one. Make sure you talk to people. Make sure you interview a, a set, set of people here, maybe about 20% or so, and make sure you understand more around the context behind the data. And then gather objective metrics. This is all good stuff, but we do need to have some objective metrics to balance out our view. Make sure you look at lead time, look at things like MTTR, or look at other things that are directly related to corporate objectives. Make sure you can tie this back. This will help you later on also when people say, was your agile transformation successful? And you can say, well, based on those things that are important to you, we started off here, and now we can see the changes. The great thing about agile ways of working is that it's not vapor. If you actually start to work in an agile way, it will make a positive impact on speed, on quality, on employee engagement. Now, these are things that agile really works with. So do not be afraid of collecting objective metrics. That is extremely important. And of course, take action. That's the last part. You've got to do that. If you don't do anything with this data, well, by definition, that's wasteful. Make sure you take action based on the data. Make sure you look at that data. Make sure you communicate it. Make sure you get the support from management and leadership. And then be very clear to everyone who took the survey that you're doing these changes now and these efforts are happening because of their feedback. Their voice matters. That's how you create that culture of data-driven continuous improvement. So up until this point, this has been quite a... <laughs> a sunshine story, right? I mean, it seems pretty simple. Just do this and it'll work. Well, to be honest with you, everything I've said is true, but there is one thing that I want you to be aware of, and that is, it is very important to be able to listen to people. It's, it's important to gather the data. It's important to understand what the challenges are, but without psychological safety, it is really hard to make this work in real life. And the reason for that is that psychological safety does require you to be honest. It requires you to point out where challenges are. It requires you to speak up without feeling worried about being ridiculed, without being worried about being punished. And that's part of what's going to make this work for you. So psychological safety is a key success factor to this. Here is a classic example of psychological safety. 
Now, if you could see this particular image, you see a person here and he's pulling a, 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 a string essentially, and that's called an and on cord. That particular and on cord, what that does is it shuts down the entire production line on a car factory. And this is uh, what's called Anzen in, in Japanese. And this is a very important concept in lean. What it means is that when you see a defect, if you see a, a, a problematic development happening, you are empowered to pull that cord and stop the entire production line. And what happens then is that no single car gets produced once that cord gets pulled. And then everyone will swarm and help each other and try to find out the root cause of the problem, fix that problem, and then we can start work again. But you can imagine, you know, when you are when you're pulling that cord, when you when you're closing that production line temporarily, that's a very expensive proposition. There's millions of dollars potentially on the line here, every single minute where a car is not being produced. So you can imagine it takes some guts, and it takes psychological safety. To be able to do that, it takes the knowledge that management and the company culture will support you when you pull that cord. When you say that something isn't quite right, when you speak up and say that, hey, we really aren't producing quality software here. When you say that we're really not collaborating nicely together and we're not communicating in a helpful way, speaking up about these things is crucial because if you don't feel comfortable doing so, well, it doesn't mean the problem's disappear, they still stay there and you're not going to improve anything. So that's why psychological safety is so important. And this example here is a very concrete example of it. We saw the difference, of course, this is going back a few years, but if you look at car manufacturers, the Japanese car manufacturing industry had much better quality of those cars coming out in the 80s and 90s because they had this type of culture, whereas the American car manufacturers, for instance, well, if you pull that cord, well, you might actually get in trouble. That could be a, car, a career limiting move. So, uh, yeah, you could see the difference there. The, the quality of those American cars was, was not great back then. Of course, things have changed since then. A lot of these concepts are now very much invested in and fully integrated into the car manufacturing industry. But that's exactly the type of thinking that we need to see here also. We need psychological safety to make these changes. And we want to give some credit to Dr. Amy Emmonson. She is a professor at Harvard. She wasn't necessarily the person who invented the term, but she was certainly a person who helped popularize it. And I like her, her category here or her definition of it. She says, psychological safety is a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. And I think that's a, that's a very nice way of encapsulating what this means. Uh, and, and, and that's that's the essence of it. And if we don't have that type of safety, if we don't have that type of understanding in our culture that we can speak up, then improvement of any kind is, is incredibly difficult to make uh, happen and very, if not impossible, to make stick. So that's why this is so important. So how do you do this? Well, this webinar is certainly not meant to give you a whole course on psychological safety, but there's a couple of things you could do right away as a leader. Uh, what you can do is lead by example. Make mistakes. I mean, don't necessarily make the mistakes for the cost of making mistakes. But when you do make mistakes, make sure you acknowledge them. Lead by example and acknowledge the mistakes and be very open and say that, hey, you know what? I'm not perfect. I messed up on this one. And and, and be be open so that people who work for you can see that. That's that's extremely important. It's very difficult sometimes uh, to, to be the first person to admit that. And you as a leader, I think should take uh, take the first step. I think you 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 lead by example. Encourage listening. That's important here. Uh, make sure that people who don't speak up sometimes make sure they have a chance to say what they feel. Uh, ask more questions. Go a little deeper, and and make sure you you truly understand what people are feeling about how they work. I think these surveys, for instance, are really important in that category. The reason we're doing this is because we do want to understand uh, how working here. Uh, really, truly is and what we can do to try uh, to improve in it. Uh, make sure you create a safe environment in the way people interrupt or, or not interrupt each other. <laughs> in fact, what you want to do is make sure there's lots of interaction and that people can, can talk about the things they want to talk about openly without being rejected. 
Uh, you don't want people to dominate the conversation all the time. Uh, we, we don't want those, uh, you know, stupid ideas kind of uh, comments. Make sure people don't interrupt each other and be open to it. Um, develop that open mindset. That's the the fourth uh, quick step you could do here. Make sure people are comfortable receiving feedback. Doesn't mean that you just have to be nice all the time. I mean, psychological safety is not about not pointing out flaws, but it's about being open about it and being intellectually honest about it so that when we have flaws, that's great in a way that we can actually solve them. Flaws and defects and mistakes can actually be gifts if we look at them seriously and we fix the root cause of why they appeared in the first place. If we do that, if we fix the root cause of a defect, we can make sure that that particular defect doesn't occur again, and that makes the system stronger. So it's 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 quite uh, advantageous if we look at it that way. So these are all things you can do to create psychological safety. Of course, I really recommend you look at Dr. Amy Ellenson's book. She has a book called Fearless Organization, which I think is excellent. So I highly recommend you look at that. So if we were to summarize this session in a nutshell, I think there's a couple of things that kind of looks at the entire, that the entire scope of this webinar quite quickly. In a nutshell, this is really about two things. It's about having meaningful data and it's about individuals and interactions because the data in itself is extremely important. I mean, especially if you know that the data is data you can trust, like, like with comparative agility, where we have meaningful data from surveys that have been validated and that have been written by domain experts. That data in itself has to be something you can trust. So that's important. But the other part of it is to combine those insights from that data with individuals and interactions. That, of course, is the very first value in, in the Agile Manifesto, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That is part of this. You have to make that data a part of an invitation to a conversation. Psychological safety, of course, is the foundation, though, to make this work. Without psychological safety, these two things don't necessarily work so well together because people feel scared, perhaps, about talking about these issues, and that could be a problem. So you do need psychological safety, so I highly recommend you look into that. And that really is what leads to a culture of data-driven continuous improvement. That's what this is all about at the end of it. So if I were to summarize this into a couple of key takeaways, I would say, First of all, this is about growing a culture, and that kind of culture requires some intention and leadership commitment. None of this is going to happen unless you have leaders who truly want to invest in these insights, who want to invest in making these changes. Because changes doesn't happen by itself. You do need to make some effort, and you do need leadership commitment to do so. The other part I want to say, without that psychologically safe environment, um, unless you have honesty, unless you can be open about what's happening, improvement efforts is really not going to happen. You you might make some incremental changes, but if you want to do this for the long run, you need people to be honest and to feel comfortable sharing that feedback. So that's extremely important as a foundation. At the end of the day, though, this is not about getting the answers. You know, embracing that culture of data-driven continuous improvement is not just about finding the answers. The data will help you with insights, but really what it will do is help you ask better questions. Yes, you'll have recommendations from us. Yes, you'll understand where the challenges are. You'll also understand which teams are suffering more than others. But at the end of the day, this is about asking better questions and then creating a learning organization, an organization that improves continuously and that is a little bit better today than it was yesterday. So in the end of the day, this is not about data. It's actually about using the data as an invitation to a conversation and then ultimately focusing on individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And that should be familiar to you if you're into Agile, which I'm hoping you are. So that, of course, is the first value of the Agile Manifesto. So that's what this is all about. And that's really what this webinar was all about. I am more than happy to talk about this in more detail. I am, as you may have figured out, quite a bit of a nerd when it comes to this stuff. Did write a book about it. So feel free to take a look at that. But also send me emails at any point in time. Just send me an email at jorgen at comparativeagility.com. Uh, and, and you can also see me on Twitter at, uh, at Jay Hesselberg. I'll be more than happy to talk about these kind of topics. Uh, I, I quite uh, quite enjoy it, to be honest with you. Uh, some of the resources that, that I used as part of setting up this uh, talk is, is listed here, uh, not directly perhaps, but at least uh, indirectly and through inspiration. I did actually list my own book on there, which I know is bad form, but it's true. <laughs> A lot of this particular 
presentation is also based on my book, but there's lots of other great books here to recommend. Uh, I think, of course, Don Reinertsen's book is is great. Eric Ries is a classic. Uh, Nassim uh, Taleb, of course, uh, Skin in the Game and Anti-Fragile. So lots of great books here that I recommend you take a look at. And now Q&A. Um, if you have questions, uh, I am more than willing to take some questions. So uh, I will just uh, sit back and, and try to answer as many questions as I can. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed the talk.